Who are the most dangerous elements in human society? How did they escape punishment for their actions from the nation states in which they function? Are they envious? Are they demoniac? What is their destination after death? What is the essence of their business? These questions will be answered in detail and succinctly in the second half of our presentation. In the material universe, the default is disobedience. The defaults here are all negative, and the Parameshvara has ultimately designed every material universe to be a place of punishment. Tremendous effort must be made in order to transcend its clutches. Rationalism is helpful in the beginning, but mukti is only attained by revelation. You have to strive in order to actuate the absolute truth. That is the only real positive alternative because the absolute is transcendental to the Mahat Tattva. The fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation appears to represent the highest dimension of the absolute truth. In many people's minds, it appears to be the Hare Krishna movement. It appears to be, but nay, it is not. There is a governing body of so-called ISKCON. It's been around since the summer of 1970, and it was meant to maintain the honesty that is intrinsic to Brahminical culture. How did it wind up? For the first year or so of its existence, it functioned according to its charter which is still in the historical record and called the Direction of Management. As such, it served the Guru, serving the founder of this branch, called the Hare Krishna Movement, this branch of the Guru Parampara. That founder was and is His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. It was and is called the Hare Krishna Movement in common parlance. On a corporate basis, it's called the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, the acronym of which is ISKA. After some time, even while the founder was physically manifest, the governing body gradually, insidiously, and as it turned out, irreversibly, became corrupted by dishonesty. The Putra faction was not noticed by most of the society's devotees in the early years, but it was noticed by your host speaker, who is now communicating what he knows to you. Our presentation is about the all-pervasive influence of the mode of ignorance on everybody and everything in this world, especially when the West degraded into a postmodern mentality in the second half of the 70s. Secondly, it's about the false narrative woven by the aforementioned Governing Body Commission of the, air quotes, ISKCON movement, a narrative shot through with mendacity. Here and after, this commission will be referred to by its initials, viz. the GBC. Specifically, it will usually be referred to as the vitiated GBC. To some extent, last month, we discussed this commission's concocted and self-serving narrative. 
In delineating the real narrative, however, no punches should be pulled, and they will not be. As the rationalization spread by the commission must be overcome. This entails directly presenting a historical narrative as it is, not according to, air quotes, ISKCON, historical revisionism. Instead, it must be presented straight, sharp, incisive, graphic, clear, and uncompromised. The commission has fully deserved that vitiated adjective before its agency's name or acronym, and it's deserved that since the spring of 1978. Those members cannot be charged for their criminality in any mundane court of law. No nation state can try them. Still, not a jot or a tittle will escape being either dotted or crossed in relation to them, ultimately. A society deserves the criminals it produces. The corruption and conversion of ISKCON into so-called ISKCON was not only insidious and gradual, but it was also inexorable. The 11 great pretenders, all governing body commissioners, by the way, imposed a major deviation on the society in the late 70s. It matched the degeneration into ignorance, which was ushered into Western culture via the postmodern mode of nihilism and absurdity, and that was ushered in also in the late 70s. We shall touch upon incidents in so-called ISKCON, which led to its conversion into a warped replica of what it was and what it was meant to be. The second part of the presentation will encapsulate some points in terms of the actual narrative of what went down and why. This led to the whole movement becoming shot through with dishonesty. As a result, the Governing Body Commission for the past 40 plus years has been nothing but a body of lies. The final part of this presentation will discuss the essence of the three broken arrows, the splinter groups falsely believed by many today to represent the Hare Krishna movement, which they do not. What is their actual modality? They are all splinter groups, all perversions, of the society that Prabhupada wanted, ordered, and envisioned. First, the mothership. In point of fact, it is the primary splinter group. That is so-called ISKCON, of course. The other two, in chronological order of their manifestations, are Neomut and Ritvik. Their relationship is not to one another, but to the mode of ignorance. Also explained will be how all three of them are thoroughly ensconced in different and specific lies as supplying root claims to their so-called legitimacy. All three will be presented as components of the same universal energy located just outside the esoteric plane. They can never be participants in the esoteric plane because it's pure. However, they can and do imitate being so. All of the leaders of these pseudo-spiritual scams are acting in massive misuse of free will on both the personal as well as the group plane, and their narratives are all based upon lies. In the material universe, the default is disobedience. The default is cold. The default is darkness. The default is ignorance. The default is distraction. The default is illusion. The default is destruction. And the default is despair. 
Most importantly, the default is lie after lie covering over many previous lies. The three splinter groups are all engaged in covering and perverting Krishna consciousness in the name of spreading it. The conflicting revisionist nations pushed by each of them is ultimately all interrelated, but only in this way. Genuine Krishna consciousness is the peace formula. In no small part, this is because Krishna consciousness promotes sattva guna, the mode of goodness. Peace is integrally connected to the mode of goodness, despite the propaganda that it's only attained through strength. The mode of ignorance is the opposite of the mode of goodness, and it promotes strife and war, especially when combined with the mode of passion. Many people are under the impression that the postmodern world is still mostly under the mode of passion, which it allegedly was in past decades. Such is not the case, however, even if it was the case. Virtually the whole world at this time is dominated by the mode of ignorance. Animal slaughter and meat eating are vicious activities under the influence of the mode of ignorance. Although exact statistics are not available, certainly the majority make that the vast majority of people in the Western world are engaged in eating meat, fish, and eggs, which are not meant for human consumption. No one can be in the mode of goodness who is engaged in this abominable activity. Similarly, abortion is also under the mode of ignorance. The second law of thermodynamics also known as the law of entropy, can be summarized as follows. Without the presence of a living force, everything in the universe moves towards chaos. From the time of the zygote, the presence of living force works against the tendency of the universe to always tear apart, sometimes quickly and sometimes very slowly, in putrefaction, destruction, and chaos. Killing animals and murdering human beings, even in the womb, is action in the mode of ignorance. Everyone has the right to live, but those in the mode of ignorance adopt their own concocted code in order to rationalize killing other living entities. Some of those in the mode of ignorance don't even adopt a code, but just kill because they get something from it and or because it pleases them. This is the mentality of the savage, which can be summarized as follows. If it's good for me, it's good. And if it's good for me and bad for you, then it's even better. Most so-called civilized human beings in the postmodern world are nothing more than two-legged animals or two-legged reptiles. In other words, they have the consciousness of an animal or a reptile, although their karma at the time of their birth merited the rare human form. This form presents the opportunity to seek liberation from the cycle of birth and death. Those engaged in killing other living entities have virtually no chance of such liberation, except if they accidentally die at a rare blessed moment. These rare moments take place, but they are infrequent, very infrequent. Chapter 8 in Bhagavad Gita describes the criteria that must be met, and it consists of restrictive factors. It should be obvious for those that die at these moments that their deaths are based upon luck. Otherwise, Humans engaged in the murdering and killing, the marketing, the serving, and the so-called enjoyment of destroying other humans or animals are not transmitters of peace. They are conduits of war, both within themselves and in human society as a whole. 
The other activity thoroughly in the mode of ignorance also must be mentioned. Intoxication. Notice that the second and third syllables of this well-known word and well-known activity sums up what it essentially is. It is engagement in poisoning oneself. Toxic activity is usually a slow form of death, although there are exceptions to this, of course. Killing oneself is not what you are here for. And intoxication is not meant for the human being, although some form of it is legal in one form or another in virtually every nation state of the world. When there is no peace at the individual level, there can be no peace in the family except only sporadically. When there is no peace at the level of the family, only laws and law-abiding citizens of a regulated civic entity, along with a well-regulated militia, can maintain peace at the level of the community or the state or the nation state. The mode of ignorance, like the other two modes, functions on the physical plane, the astral, and the causal. When someone is completely situated in the mode of ignorance on the causal plane, he or she is the most dangerous element in human society, with one special exception, which was alluded to in the many questions which began this podcast, and that will be described later, as already indicated. The real issue to contend with here is that of the mind, which means the astral plane. The astral interpenetrates all that we smell, taste, see, feel, and hear. These are the gross energies, although two of them, the pranic and the ethereal, cannot be seen. The astral is more subtle than those two, and the topic of describing it is very difficult for a number of reasons. You have to accept bona fide knowledge from higher spiritual authorities. We shall simply make the point, which should be more or less obvious to most of you listening to and or reading this podcast, that the lower astral is the plane of ignorance, although it also has many layers. It is the predominant astral at this time in human history. As far as that goes, it is getting worse, not better. The vast majority of human beings in today's civilizations, what to speak of the Neanderthal and troglodyte tribes or so-called nation states, are in the mode of ignorance. Although the many mental speculators who decry this tragic condition, after finally admitting to it being factual, constantly talk about how to rectify and reverse it, Although they do this, such is not possible, except for some minor and temporary tweaks, without genuine Krishna consciousness. Humans have slipped from the mode of goodness, being dominant in human society 5,000 years ago, to intermittent periods of time where passion was more prominent. However, that is now coming to an end in point of fact, it has ended. Even in India, animal slaughter, intoxication, and meat eating is now legal in some states. Once Ireland legalized abortion recently, all of Europe has now legalized murdering developing human beings in the womb. The nation-state paradigm is on the verge of cratering. It is going to be replaced by a form of totalitarianism preceded by an apocalypse which that new paradigm is barely able to prevent and only in part. This is going to lead to some kind of world cataclysm and your author will be discussing how he contemplates all of this going down in a future book to hopefully be published soon. Suffice it to say that unless devotees of the Lord 
are able to emerge from underside the roof that has been erected over them for the past 40 plus years by so-called transcendentalists, fate will win. It will not be pretty, let me assure you. Those so-called transcendentalists are the splinter groups, which the Vaishnav Foundation works constantly to expose. Let us now segue to that stage of the presentation. It is time to open the spiritual Overton window. How can we possibly expect the Karmis and Vic Karmis to open their Overton window if the devotees and Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement do not first open theirs? It is now time to put the palms of your hands up Get under the lowest sill of the window and do a preacher curl with full force. Shove that thing right up to the top. Open it wide. What is referred to here is the real narrative of what went down and why in Prabhupada's movement, or to be more specific, exposing what is pushed by the three perverted reflections of it. Each of those three splinter groups has its own patented narrative, but that needs clarification because Ritvik is so fractionalized, there are many more narratives from all of its different offshoots since 1989. However, we shall not delve into all of that. We shall concentrate upon the very first splinter, which is, of course, so-called ISKCON. The deviation of the mothership, the big kahuna, led to the emergence of the other two groups. For the sake of this podcast being understood, we shall consider Ritvik to be one deviation, although, as just mentioned, it is actually many. As far as that goes, Neomut is also itself split, but for the sake of describing the actual narrative, we shall consider it to be one. Both Neomat and Ritvik are cent percent deviations. And they are not interrelated. But they are based on separate wrong principles. As promised, we're going to get into the historical record in order to help you overcome all of these narratives And these narratives are sucking thousands of innocent and not sincere enough devotees into them. However, before the details, let's attempt an overview. You are all afforded to take a shortcut to reject each of the three of them. Of course, if your astral body has been polluted to such an extent that it's now in the astral crapper, Nothing can be done for you. Your overton window is very narrow and hardly open at all. Maya will fill your squirming brains with nescience as soon as this knowledge is presented to you. You have allowed yourself to become degraded by mistaken knowledge, wrong facts, warped descriptions of what went down, and thus your vision is clouded. Due to bad association, there's hardly any chance for you, but if there is a chance, no matter how slim, it's now being provided to you in this podcast. The three deviations can be overcome instantly because they're shortcuts. All you have to do is have the spiritual overtime window open within your own mind and intelligence. That may be asking a lot, but ultimately does not require much if you make the original effort. In other words, here are the shortcuts in order to instantly dismiss and overcome the evil Lilliputian leaders, cheap gurus and their chelas, representing the three chief deviations pinning down your devotional Gulliver. First, let us consider so-called ISKCON. What is its chief deviation? Well, that's easy to understand. It's the vitiated GBC, 
which authorized the 11 zonal pretenders. Prabhupada only authorized regular gurus, who are not, by definition, Uttama He did not even officially name any such regular gurus, but that regulative principle was all that he authorized. The vitiated GBC instead appointed on a very flawed basis, which was no basis at all, 11 of their own to be Mahabhagavats. The GBC awarded these commissioners with an exclusive monopoly of initiation and demarcated zones covering the whole world. This was a massive deviation from what was authorized by the founder Acharya. Whatever mumbo-jumbo and air quotes ISKCON apologist uses to rationalize any of this is nothing more than a massive deviation from what it was and what it remains. No one can possibly be a bona fide guru who is one of these 11, who recognized these men as spiritual masters, who was a hatchet man and enforcer for them, who worshipped them as the highest of the high when in actuality there were sahajiyas of the lowest variety possible, and who spread the message and narrative that propped them up. A river runs through it. All of that is still present in today's so-called ISKCON. It's present in a subtle way. But if you understand cause and effect, you should immediately understand that. And if you don't understand cause and effect, what are you doing as a so-called transcendentalist? They were all bogus. The movement was polluted. As far as the real ISKCON movement was concerned, this outrageous deviation murdered it. In 1978, Bas, case closed. Tatvamasi. Let us now consider Neomat. Like so called ISKCON, it can also be very easily dismissed. All of the Neomat gurus who were initiated by Prabhupada and crossed the river to join Swami B.R. Sridhar are traitors of the worst variety possible. This is because they are promulgating an upasiddhanta on a topic that is crucial to the Vaishnava tattva given to us by Prabhupada. And that tattva is the origination of the jiva. These men, some of whom are warlocks with dandas, are committing a kind of treason against Prabhupada, who they minimize. They know full well that Prabhupada clearly stated that the jiva did not emanate originally either from the Brahma Jodi or from the causal plane. Here's but one of many examples where he indisputably stated that, quote, unless one develops full devotional service to Krishna, he goes up only to Brahma Sayuja, but falls down. But after millions and millions of years of keeping oneself away from the Leela of the Lord, when one comes to Krishna consciousness, this period becomes insignificant. Because he falls down from Brahma Sayuja, he thinks that this may be his origin. But he does not remember that before that even, he was with Krishna, unquote. The collateral damage caused by Niyamat in pushing their Gaudiyamat Upasiddhanta, received by Swami B.R. Sridhar primarily from him, that collateral damage is immeasurable. Reject the Neomat claptrap, which attempts to explain how Prabhupada allegedly meant something diametrically different from what he clearly preached. He actually preached one thing, and in opposition, both Gaudiamut and Neomat misled and mislead thousands by preaching something else. This is how we can easily know, without a great deal of effort, that Neomat gurus are bogus. Bas! 
Case closed. Let us now consider Ritvik. This manifestation of crypto-Christianity has nothing to do with genuine Vaishnavism. It also can be easily dismissed just as you shake off vermin from a coat fallen on the cloakroom floor. First of all, where's the proof? There's no conclusive evidence presented by the Ritviks. Instead, all you get from them is endlessly mutable word salad loaded with mistaken knowledge, illogical connections of weak proposals, and faulty presuppositions. For many, many thousands of years, the four disciplic successions, authorized and specified in Padma Purana, have carried on via the tradition of a physically manifest guru as a man initiating his disciple here on earth. The guru takes the sanchta karma because he has a body which can then absorb it. Prabhupada never established any new system. If he had envisioned doing so, there would be solid proof of it. There wasn't, and there isn't. Not only because he never wanted his branch of the Guru Parampara to be carried out like that, but also because such a concoction, following in the footsteps of Christian priests, is totally unauthorized. No spiritual master could do such a thing. Only a Sahajya could attempt this, and there was one such case many hundreds of years ago. It was called the Kartabhaja line, and it was exposed specifically by Srila Poktivano Thakur as being one of the 13 Sahajya groups, all of which take the process of Bhakti cheaply. The Ritviks compare Prabhupada to, to Jesus Christos, and there's nothing accidental about that. Jesus Christos has nothing to do with the spiritual and devotional science passed down from spiritual master to perfected disciple throughout the history of the Vaishnava tradition. He was not initiated into any sampradaya of the Vaishnava line or any branch of any sampradaya. He's not a part of any line or branch of Vaishnava Shishtatra. The other two splinter groups, so-called Iskana Niyamat, are false schools. But Ritvik is a wrong school. It is preposterous from the gate. Sincere and serious disciples in our branch have studied the real system. They have compared it to the faulty arguments of the cheap backdoor gurus, read so-called Ritvik Acharyas, advocating Ritvik in abstentia. These real devotees, in doing so by such analysis, have completely rejected the Ritvik argument as nothing more than another version of historical revisionism. Those who have recognized the brain-dead articles put forth by the so-called Prabhupada Nugas in their imitation, quote, back to Prabhupada, quote, magazine, know it well that the foundation of Ritvik is built on sand. It will not stand, and it is destined to be condemned. As such, in an encapsulated form, we have presented quick and easy ways, all totally bonafide, to dismiss the three splinter groups above mentioned. They're all dangerous, and they all have their own narratives, which they each present as history. All of those narratives emanate from a warped perspective. The gradation of their danger, to those who even initially start to believe their narratives, must now be briefly discussed. You have to secure the right perspective. Ritvik is ridiculous. 
Because it takes initiation as being given, which it never has been and never will be, by a non-manifest spiritual master who departed physical manifestation over 46 years ago, he's unable to directly protest what they claim they are burdening him with and what they falsely claim he is doing for them. As long as you reject Ritvik's chief presupposition, which is very ridiculous, along with its flawed overall perspective and narrative of the backdoor gurus, Ritvik is not as dangerous as the other two narratives. As far as Neomut's narrative is concerned, it's very dark. In point of fact, it's pitch black. If you get caught in that wheelhouse, Neomut's vortex is a tough extraction, let me tell you. However, its influence is limited. It is clearly linked not to Prabhupada, who it utterly minimizes it, who it utterly minimizes, but it's clearly linked to Gaudiamat. Here's what Prabhupada had to say about Gaudiamat. Quote, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, at the time of his departure, requested all his disciples to form a governing body and conduct missionary activities cooperatively. He did not instruct a particular man to become the next Acharya. But just after his passing away, his leading secretaries made plans without authority to occupy the post of Acharya and they split into two factions over who the next Acharya would be. Consequently, both factions were asara, or useless, because they had no authority, having disobeyed the order of the spiritual master. Despite the spiritual master's order to form a governing body and execute the missionary activities of the Gaudiamat, the two unauthorized factions began litigation, which is still going on after 40 years with no decision. Therefore, we do not belong to any faction. But because the two parties, busy dividing the material assets of the Gaudiamat institution, stopped the preaching work, we took up the mission. Unquote. This excerpt is from a purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, chapter 12, text 8. The purport is self evident and your host speaker could easily fill a 5,000-word article with many more potent quotes from Prabhupada's letters and books, buttressing the fact that Prabhupada condemned Gaudiamat in no uncertain terms. As such, the perspective of Neomat, which, as aforementioned, really has no connection to Prabhupada, is easy to overcome for any devotee, male or female, who has the courage to confront and reject it. For this reason, although Neomat is more poisonous than so-called Iskan in its perspective and narrative, Neomat is limited with less subtlety. It is more clearly condemned and less dangerous for that reason than the narrative of the mothership. Let us take up the wrong narratives in a kind of amalgamated way. What do the three splinter groups have in common? They're antagonistic to one another. They have different perspectives and narratives, all of which constitute historical revisionism. They have different moods, different styles, different centers. They have different leaders, different members, in their echelon ranks and corporate hierarchies, they have different patrons, and they have different followers and disciples. Each of them will only allow their own priests to engage in worship ceremonies on altars in their own centers. Superficially, at least, it appears they have almost nothing in common. To a very great extent, such is the case, and that is wanted. However, Generically speaking, they all have one thing in common. 
Despite their different formats, they're all engaged in the same thing. D, E, C, E, P, T, I, O, N, deception. Ultimately, there's no real difference between deception and lying because lies are the inexorable result of deception. The bromine, quote, it is to deceive the disciple, unquote, was advocated by Swami B.R. Sridhar when he convinced the 11 seeds of Uttama pretension to nourish themselves in the highly fertilized soil that he provided. Of course, all 11 of those men were established cult manipulators before the spring of 1978, but deception got fully baked into the ISKCON cake at that time. Now, what mode facilitates deception? It cannot be the mode that facilitates honesty, can it? Of course not. Brahmins are, by both constitution and action, absorbed in honesty. Sincerity is based upon honesty. Brahmins are in the mode of goodness. Their prachara is honest. They deal straightforward. This is verified in Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 18, verse 42. Is deception integral to the mode of passion? Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. The Vaishya sometimes engages in deception, granted, but he is in a peculiar combination of the modes of passion and ignorance. No king can gain the confidence of his protectorate if he is constantly lying to them. They cannot feel at all protected if their king or president is deceptive about, deceptive about anything and everything. In other words, there's some deception in the mode of passion, but it's not intrinsic to it. It is subordinated by other qualities which trump it. And that leaves us with the actual answer. Deception is intrinsic and integral to the mode of ignorance. Are the three splinter groups deceiving any of you? To the degree that you are susceptible to their false propaganda, they most certainly are. We've pointed out the specifics of this throughout the podcast. The leaders of so-called ISKCON have been and continue to be liars. They lied about how the first transformation of the zonals was authorized by Prabhupada, which it never was. They lied when they merged the appointment of Ritviks into the appointment of Diksha Gurus, which was never the case. They lied when they implemented and institutionalized the bad advice, read lies, which they swallowed hook, line, and sinker from Swami B.R. Sridhar. Throughout the history of so-called ISKCON, their whole narrative has been shot through with lies. And where did all these lies come from? Well, that's not difficult to answer. All of it came from ISKCON liars. And virtually all of it, if not all of it, was sanctioned by the vitiated GBC a board which should now be seen as nothing more than a body of lies. It consisted of liars in the 70s and has consisted of liars ever since. None of its men or women are actually Brahmins because the dishonesty that it is based upon is anything but representative of the mode of goodness. It was supposed to be an advisory body of Brahmins, but it degraded into something much lower and more sinister. What about Niamat? It also consists of liars. They all lie when they claim that the Jiva Tattva did not originally emanate, read, fall down from, the spiritual world. They lie when they claim, ever so briefly, 
that their generally initiated disciples of Prabhupada when in point of fact they're all traitors to both him and his branch of the Guru Parampara. What about Ritvik? The Ritviks are also liars. They lie when they say that Prabhupada established Ritvik in perpetuity as his legacy when he never did any such thing. They lie to all of their chelas when they convince them that those chelas are initiated by Prabhupada. If they come or came to what superficially appeared to be the Hare Krishna movement after November of 1977, those chelas were not initiated into a connection to the disciplic succession known as the Madhva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. They were reluctant to accept the real way on the manifest plane to become initiated by a bona fide spiritual master. As per the purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, Chapter 1, Text 35, they will pay a price for that reluctance, especially if they preach against the proper way, which all Ritviks do. Quote, One should always remember that a person who is reluctant to accept a spiritual master and be initiated is sure to be baffled in his endeavor to go back to Godhead. One who is not properly initiated, may present himself as a great devotee, but in fact, he is sure to encounter many stumbling blocks on his path of progress towards spiritual realization, with the result that he must continue his term of material existence without relief. Such a helpless person is compared to a ship without a rudder, for such a ship can never reach its destination. If one thinks that he is above consulting anyone else, including a spiritual master, he is at once an offender at the lotus feet of the Lord. Such an offender can never go back to Godhead. It is imperative that a serious person accept a bona fide spiritual master in terms of the Shastric injunctions. Sri Jiva Goswami advises that one not accept a spiritual master in terms of hereditary or customary social and ecclesiastical conventions, unquote. Now, you may remember the questions were asked at the beginning of this presentation. Here are the answers to those questions from a purport to Sri Ishapanishad Mantra 12. Quote, these rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. Because there is no religious government, they escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme, who has clearly declared in the Bhagavad Gita that envious demons, in the garb of religious propagandists, shall be thrown into the darkest regions of hell. Sri Ishopanishad confirms that these pseudo-religionists are heading toward the most obnoxious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master business, which they conduct simply for sense gratification. Unquote. The colossal hoax known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. So-called ISKCON in general, and the vitiated GBC in particular, are fully responsible for the antagonistic splinter groups set into motion after the disastrous implementation of the Zonal Acharya imposition in the late 70s. That imposition was based upon a series of lies. All the rationalizations as to why it was understandable 
and forgivable are so much detritus that has not come anywhere near washing out to sea. That recrudescence is still present today in so many forms. All perspectives that do not recognize this fact, including all the narratives spun forth from such perverted perspectives pushed by members of organized religion, continue to plague the remaining few sincere and serious devotees of truth, truth with a capital T. Lord Chaitanya's golden age cannot be spread in such a state of affairs. As such, this terrible condition must be removed by any means legal. We start with exposing all of the lies that it's based upon, especially the lie that the vitiated GBC has any spiritual authority left whatsoever. We progress from there until critical mass is achieved and the time of reckoning and retribution becomes both obvious and inexorable. Sadeva Samya, 